Hi, I'm Neil McLaughlin. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Great, okay. Uh, so thank you very much for participating in the uh, collected drawing. Um, I am what you might call the Intermission Act. Uh, while the team are um, away uh, taking all of your um, drawings and turning them into a single drawing, I'm going to just talk about the idea of drawing together. So I'm going to do the most difficult part of my day today. Um, can the host disable the attendee screen sharing, please? I want to share the screen if possible. Okay. So I'm just about to uh, start a PowerPoint presentation, if you'll give me a moment. Um, what I want to do now is to talk for about 20 minutes on uh, the a number of drawing projects which we've done where we were drawing together. Um, and um, my intention is to try to um, explain something about the uh, ideas that we're interested in in relation to communal drawing. Um, I want to talk first of all about the sort of drawings that we do in the studio. Uh, as an architect, I don't tend to sit in a room by myself and draw uh, until recently at least. Um, my uh, design and drawing practice is one which is collegiate and communal where we work together with the team. Um, and I'm very interested in the idea that when we're drawing together, that the drawing, that once you put it on the page, it embodies an idea, or it embodies an intuition. Uh, but once that's been materialized, it becomes available for other people to think about and to talk about. And that's an extraordinary kind of lever in the design process. This is a project we're doing in Cambridge at the moment, which is being built. But when we were designing it, I can see at least seven or eight hands involved in drawing variations on the plan of this building as we passed it around between each other. And there's that sense that a group of people possess a kind of uh, an ability that when they're sitting around a table drawing together, they become like one mind. It's a, I would think of it as being a form of extended cognition in some way, that we collectively, by materializing our thoughts and intuitions, are able to, um, are able to design things and make progress in a way that we never would designing by ourselves. Um, I want to talk about a few projects that were done individually. And the first one relates to a drawing we did around a chapel which we designed in Oxford about a decade ago. And um, while we were designing the chapel, you can see it here as a simple elliptical enclosure uh, with a timber frame inside it. But while we were designing the chapel, I was asked by my old professor, John Toomey, to come over to Dublin and to give a lecture about one of our buildings. And I chose this one and he said, could we bring something like a model or an artifact to put in the room next door? So what we did was to remember that the medieval masons, uh, when they were building cathedrals, used to uh, pour plaster of Paris on the floor and draw their stone jigs on the floor as they were building. And uh, we were completely enchanted by the idea that the building is built around the drawing somehow. That the drawing starts on the ground and you build a building around it. And that you raise each of these drawn pieces up into the roof to make a structure. And so we thought it would be lovely to make a drawing like that on the floor of the room we were given. So we asked a local builder to come in and to pour lime plaster onto the whole floor of this simple Georgian room in University College Dublin. Through that doorway is the room where we would be giving the talk at the end of the week. And the project team from the office came across and joined four students from the School of Architecture there. And the eight of us spent one week making a drawing. And I suppose the point about it is that it was the drawing itself as an artifact, but there was also the performance of the drawing and the theatre of it. And it was an interesting room and that lots of doors led into it. So people would be walking by and watching the drawing being made during the week. And it became an activity that was part of the life of the school. You can see here we're using those old blue pencils, blue line pencils to set out the form of the ellipse of the chapel. And what also interested me in this process was the way that as the drawing itself emerged, the relationship between the bodies that necessarily had to fill the space of the drawing became part of it and became part of the drawing itself. And also, even a decade ago, at the old fashioned labor of making a drawing, it's amazing when you go back to using those wax pencils on plaster, just how much your hand hurts after about an hour of drawing, the constant sharpening and resharpening of the pencils, uh, and the way in which we worked together as a team and communicated with each other and found our own kind of working rhythm. And you can see here some of the texture of the drawing itself, working over the surface of the plaster, the old setting out pencil that gives us the setting out lines of the ellipse. And the orange line here is the reflected ceiling plan of the structure overhead in one tiny detail. Um, and the way in which people bit by bit would begin to work together so that rather than drawing alone and as individuals, we would form clusters. And that would become a kind of a, 
um, an intermittent uh, uh, communal activity in itself. Uh, we can see on the top of this drawing here the window mullions of the chapel and the way that the structure arrives into those window mullions and all of the paraphernalia of drawing that we were using at the time. Um, and the, and, and the, the sense of all those old tools being, 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 being brought out and being used. I wanted to get you really close into the texture of this drawing because actually putting those wax pencils down on the plaster was very, very hard work. It was almost like laying a very thin line of paint onto it. And that gives us some sense of the property of the drawing. Um, and I was reminded in a way when we were doing it of this um, beautiful poem about playing marbles. Um, for those of you who are younger, marbles is a game that kids used to play together where they're accurately throwing glass balls uh, in various forms of the game. And there's a very beautiful poem by Seamus Heaney called Lightnings Three, where he talks about playing marbles. And when I read it, I thought that it was so like architect's drawing, the children playing and his description of it was so like architect's drawing, at the precision of it, the labor of it, but also the great space that opens up inside your head when you're doing it. So I'm going to pause now and just read you the poem. Forgive my handwriting. It's called Lightnings Three. Squarings. In the game of marbles, Squarings were all those anglings, aimings, feints and squints you were allowed before you'd shoot. All those hunkerings, tensings, pressures of the thumb, test outs and pullbacks, re-envisagings, all the way your arms kept hoping towards blind certainties that were going to prevail beyond the one-off moment of the pitch. A million million accuracies passed between your muscled out outreach and that space marked with three round holes and a drawn line, you squinted out from a skylight of the world. This lecture is just full of pictures of people drawing, really. There's an old flexi curve, aren't they beautiful things? And here's a, a time-lapse film that we were making from the ceiling as the drawing was being made. And you can see the drawing emerging on the floor of the room, on the top, the window, which is bringing the light in. And on the other three sides, doorways, it lead off into different rooms. It was a curious thing uh, that when we, we planned this months in advance, but a fortnight before it happened, my father died. And I remember when I was making this drawing, I was wearing his watch for the first time. And being Ireland, it's very different to London. When someone dies, people want to stop and talk to you about it. So people would come and stand in the doorway of the room, like you can see on the right hand side there, and talk for up to half an hour about his life. And so I remember this drawing as being this amazing space, a space in the project where uh, it had been designed but not yet built and the builders would be going to site next week to put it up. And also this kind of still point in my life when things were changing and I could just dwell in the drawing with this amazing group of people for a week. And when you roll over on your back and imagine what the ceiling would be like, it would have been something like this. This is the built ceiling of the chapel. And it's that sense that the drawing is a projection of these spaces into the future. The next one I want to speak about is a different kind of drawing, which we did for the Venice Biennale uh, in, in, um, in 2016. And we, are, as, a, as a practice, have been working around issues related to dementia for a long time. And we had designed a care home for people with dementia in Dublin. And we wanted to make the project about that. And I became interested in the idea um, I was collaborating on this project with my, uh, my long-term teaching partner, Yoia Manalapulu. We became interested in the idea of uh, the way architects draw plans, envisage all of the building all at once, as though you can see every bit of it all in one, all in one viewing. You might call it an allocentric view. But for people with dementia, the world is always falling away behind them. They can't remember and they can't project in the same way. So they live in a kind of continuous present. And we wondered what kind of plan you would draw that would describe the experiences of the building for people with dementia. And so using the architectural notation of drawing, how would you do that? And Yuri and I started making these very messy and potentially ugly drawings in the studio, trying to work out how you would do that, but just trying to force ourselves to think about the problem. And we came up with this very simple conceit that you could put a sheet of tracing paper onto, onto a pane of glass and then draw the tracing paper and that you could film through the glass and that the film would not be a drawing as an artifact, but a drawing as a performance. The, 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 and, and maybe the idea that the line of the pencil as it moves across the page could be seen as being a kind of correlation for the perceiving mind of the person who's witnessing the building in that moment. So the pencil drawing 
that what is being seen by the person who's experiencing became the idea of the project. And these are the sketches that we were working up to do it. And if it wasn't just one person, but 16 people, they might all be witnessing and experiencing the building in fragmentary ways at the same time. And all the time, the pencil and the hand drawing it is, is, is showing you their perception of the world in that moment. And your year made this rather beautiful score, uh, imagining how many uh, A1 sheets of tracing paper we would have to make and how they would be overlaid. So each of these rectangles is a sheet of tracing paper over the plan of the whole building over a 24 hour time cycle. So you're seeing the whole cycle of the day going through and each bit of it being explored through an A1 sheet of paper. And we made these little tables in our studio. You can see the thing about these tables is they've got glass tops and they've got cameras underneath that are filming up through the underside of the table. So the performance of the drawing can always be recorded. And this is Michiko. What we did was we got 16 of our ex-students who have their own practices and asked them to draw as though they were witnessing the building as someone who has dementia. Michiko's grandfather, who's in the photograph at the top, had dementia. And so she's drawing him waking up in the morning. And what's the first thing that he perceives and can you draw it? And she developed a kind of continuous line technique where as you draw, the world unfolds what you're perceiving and what you're building up in terms of your perception. And I want to pause for a little bit on this film. It's in one of the social rooms with a piano and people are arranging the furniture and they're about to start drawing. I really like the soundtrack. The people who are talking are trying to imagine themselves as being somebody with dementia arranging the room and soon we'll all start dancing. Michika, who's Japanese, couldn't do the walls of Limerick, so Claire, who's from Donegal, had to teach her Irish dancing with the drawings laid out on the floor. And this is us making a drawing like that together, drawing and talking as though we're having a conversation around the dancing or the gardening or whatever else we were doing, and, and, and making these drawings, which are constantly being filmed as we do it. This is Simon, Michiko, me and Yuria doing one of them. And then as we did it, we accumulated this extraordinary horde of thousands of drawings, which we began to just throw on the floor for want of space. And we found when we laid them on the floor and overlaid them that they were really beautiful together. And we thought that that might be some way in which we could bring them together for the presentation at the Biennale. This is Yuri and I going through the huge task of curating and sifting the drawings and trying to make a continuous world going through a 24 hour cycle. We're looking at a part of the garden here. And as we thought about the garden, we thought that if it went through a day, it could also go through a year. So here we are drawing different ways of it uh, coming into bloom in springtime. Uh, we were asked to make a group portrait of ourselves for the Biennale, and this was the picture that we sent them. Uh, we spent the week uh, tiptoeing, uh, week, weeks and weeks tiptoeing around on this carpet of drawings on the floor. The space in the Arsenale in which we drew it, and you can just see our installation on the inside. We couldn't hang anything from the roof, so we made these little tripods for the projectors, and the projectors mounted on the tripods then had all the data coming down from the, from the old ceiling. And the data coming down was both uh, streamed data, but also sound, which comes into all these speakers to make a kind of a soundscape uh, for the project so that the sounds of the building throughout the day are being experienced. And then this is the piece itself, the drawing, the plan of the building, which is constantly assembling and dissolving itself as it goes through the day, and people are witnessing different parts of it. I don't want to say too much about these images, just to give you an immersive sense of what it was like. It was big enough that as you moved around it, you could hear different sounds in different parts of the space and you could follow somebody as they made their way through the building and you could see their world developing and collapsing as they tried to hold it together. And we began the day with this very simple conceit of throwing sheets of tracing paper down to create dawn and to build, begin to build up the garden. 
uh, and the garden eventually begins to surround the building through these sheets of tracing paper and then people begin to wake up in the rooms. The ruler is a corridor outside the rooms and then each of the hands is somebody waking up in their own room and beginning to build their world from the fragments of their perception. As we move through it then, all of these images are stills, but of course, if you saw this, they're all moving images on the floor. Um, and you can see as we move through the day, the light changes towards dusk as the seasons change towards winter. This is just after sun, uh, sunset and early dusk and it started to rain. You can see drawings being thrown down, different people in different rooms moving about. This is an aerial view to give you a sense of what the installation was seen from above. Um, and the sense then, one of the amazing things about the way that we experience space has got to do with what we call grid cells, which are in our brain and are constantly throwing patterns onto the floor, which allow our inter rooms, which allow us to experience where we are in space and in time. So this is a subliminal part of our own experience of space that's happening. And so in the nighttime scene in the care home, we began to lay out the plan in its entirety and you could see the grid cells flickering on to show the way in which the space is being held or experienced in human cognition. And then there's just this tiny detail here, giving you a sense of the corner of the room of the drawing with the brass tripod. And so the last drawing I want to talk about during this intermission is one that Yuri and I did once again with our students in Unit 17 in the Bartlett. Um, and it related to a trip we took to the Orkney Islands. And we spent five days traveling around the archipelago, often by boat and sometimes by car, uh, and doing huge walks around the island. And what we wanted to do was to walk around the island together and to make a drawing together at the same time. And the drawing would become a kind of an embodiment of our, of our collective experience of that place. And so we hired the church hall behind St. Magnus Cathedral in Kirkwall and went there every night after our long day of walking and made the drawing together. And I love this image of the team just rolling out the page onto the floor of the, uh, of, 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 of the hall in Kirkwall and beginning to set the scene for the drawing. Um, some people say that, uh, 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 that university architecture units are a bit like cults. I think this probably proves the case. Um, but what we were doing here was making a page which was the size of all of our bodies together so that the space of the drawing will be the, the space that we all occupy. Uh, and I want to move from this image of us creating the space that size to commencing the drawing. This is just a little video which um, I can find the arrow button. Uh, I'll just give you a pause. And listen carefully, there's a lovely little um, squish on the drawing. Three, two, one. And now the drawing can commence. And there's something lovely about the way when people are drawing on the page that the space they have to draw in um, and the way they begin to draw together and the different drawing techniques they have one of the things we said was that people shouldn't talk about what their drawing would be or what their intention for the drawing was, but merely to draw and to allow watching yourself draw with other people to develop a kind of a common language that would come from the ensemble uh, formation of the group. Um, and the other thing that we did, which was fun, was we mentioned that parlor game Twister, where you all make a big pile on the floor and get entangled with each other. And the sheer sense of lots of bodies climbing over each other, trying to make different bits of the drawing was definitely part of this exercise. And what was also very beautiful was that if you were drawing on a particular piece of the drawing, then the space you were sitting in was necessarily left blank. And so when you got up to move away, you found that the space of your body was a kind of a space on the page. And so the relationship between the landscape, which was inferred in what people were drawing together, and the spaces which opened up in the landscape from the shadows of the bodies was something that we really enjoyed. And the way that the hands coming together, this sense that the hands coming together create one mind out of many minds. And that sense that I'm very interested in embodied cognition, that we think with our bodies, that our minds are not separate things. And that if we think with our bodies and our bodies are necessarily engaged with each other in the act of drawing, then some form of thinking comes out of that that is possible only when you draw together. We made very elegant forms, but some of them were sometimes a bit less elegant. We all had to sort of work around each other a little bit. Um, but the idea of it was that all of these things uh, sort of accumulated to make the drawing. And it wasn't just drawing because it happened over five days. So eating together outside the space of the drawing, talking about it through eating and going out again every day afterwards and walking the landscape again and using that walk to reinvest into the drawing. And we had all sorts of communal activities that sort of were different versions of what we were drawing. We could call this an acoustic version of it.
And each evening we'd come back and roll out the drawing again and sit around the perimeter of it and look at it and ask ourselves what we had done and have a conversation about it and say, what is it and what could we do with it next? And it was never a sense of what it should be done, what it should become. There was no sense that there was an intention being expressed about a final outcome, but rather to talk about how the process had gone and how the next day's walking could be reinvested into that process. And then we'd all get back down to do it again. Everybody would get back down and start drawing again and filling in the spaces that they had left behind the night before. And I want to just show a little bit of this video because it gives you a sense of some of the intensity of the close quarters nature of the drawing. <laughs> I love the fact that this is both intentional and, and balanced on the edge of randomness. I think there's something, there's a, there's, there's a kind of a balance in that that has got to do with improvisation that I think was a really successful aspect of this drawing. And gosh, we walked every day. It was beginning to really affect our feet at the end of the project, but the drawing developed and developed. And of course, when people started working together, they were finding more inventive ways of making their bodies dependent on each other in that kind of ensemble formation. And that was something that, in a sense, contributed to the drawing itself. And we had the surface so that, that you have to think about it as being a performance as much as a thing, and that the tools of that performance almost became temporary parts of the space of the drawing. And so I'm going to just finish with this last image of somebody standing on, over a little bit of the drawing and show you the drawing itself. I've got a few more minutes of the intermission to fill in. I'm just checking my own time. I've got three or four minutes. And I, I don't really want to uh, justify too much what this drawing is meant to be or what it's intended to be a representation of. We thought of different names or nouns that we could give it, but in a sense, it's an embodiment of a collective activity that happened over a period of five days in which we walked and made music and ate and went back to drawing in which we used our bodies and the way in which our, uh, our, our extended cognition that comes from our physical proximity would create a representation of the world which we inhabited over that time. And you might ask yourself what that's got to do with architecture. Surely the purpose of architectural drawings is to delineate the form of objects or spaces that we're going to make in the world. But my own sense of architecture is that it is not like that, that architecture is at it in its essence something which is also performative. And that if we look at any building, it's either reflecting on a performance such as its own construction through the logic of being able to rebuild it in your mind by looking at it, or it's projecting other performances such as a way in which it might be inhabited over time, or the, might, the way in which it might weather or turn into a ruin. So a building which in a sense seems to be a fixed form or a fixed set of concrete things is almost always got a reciprocal uh, relationship with the idea of performance and time. And so if, draw if buildings are fundamentally performative in that way, then the way in which drawing might also be performative maybe points to something about the relationship between drawing, design and building, which exists at a deeper level. And if we could invest into a performative form of drawing, we might be less inclined to see buildings as fixed artifacts that have their sort of moment of completion um, or tailored objects, which are works of individual authorship. And we might see them as part of the way in which so social concepts become fixed and given form through communal activity, through communal performance, and that the act of design can be structured and constructed in a communal way so that it represents and predicts the way in which the building might be constructed as a performance, inhabited as a performance, and eventually weathered as a long performance over time. So I'm going to finish the talk there. Um, I'm about a minute of, uh, short of the, the, the time that we're meant to be um, rejoining the other Zoom drawing. One thing I would like to do is just to thank Yuri Amanalapulu who has been a, the, um, a complete collaborator on the Tracing Tables project and on the Ensemble project. Um, 
uh, and has given us very helpful criticism um, for this new drawing, which we're calling Zoom. Um, and so what I want to do now is to say that the next collective drawing, which we will have in our portfolio, and which we will all have done together this evening, is a Zoom drawing which was done in London in the middle of lockdown in May 2020. And I'm hoping that I can hand back to one of my team who will take over and tell us how they're doing assembling the drawing together. Uh, yeah, many thanks, Neil, for this really lovely talk. It was really like it gave real insight into projects we did in our office. I really enjoyed it and I hope it was the same for everybody else. Um, so while Neil was talking, um, a group of our practice was working in the background and they tried to put all the collective drawings we did in the breakout rooms earlier, uh, put them together into one big composition. So James will share a work in progress image, hopefully soon. And um, the final drawing will be posted on the Architecture Foundation website and as well on our Instagram, hopefully like next week. So please come back and check and see your own work. Um, and maybe we have time. I got a couple of questions in. So Neil, if you're happy to maybe answer one quick question before we hand over to James. Yeah, um, so actually another James has asked, um, how was the lock, um, how was the lockdown measures, how have the lockdown measures changed the collaborative drawing processes in your practice? Um, I think that um, once I got past my absolute panic over trying to draw on Zoom, I found that there was a kind of new intensity sometimes to the way that we drew together and it maybe made us uh, think more about it and not take it for granted so much. And I found that over the last six weeks, one of the things which is a challenge for a practice like ours and for all of the practices around the world at the moment is how do we hold our community together? How do we hold that collegiate and collective spirit that we have that drives our practice? And I found that the drawing on Zoom was something that was able to, these little scribbly lines, they didn't have to be good, they didn't even have to be interesting, but they sort of held us together in a way that almost more than anything else allowed us to feel that we were still a collective, despite the fact that we were all little, little, little people in little windows and in individual rooms. Um, and one more question from Roy. Um, what was the relationship between the collaborative drawing of the plan of the chapel with the construction process of the chapel? Enric Miraya's drawings, ambiguity, apparently enabled collaboration between the architects and the craftsmen they collaborated with. I wonder what role your office's collaborative drawings take on later, take on later on in the process of realizing a project? Um, I think that, I mean, it was interesting for us that uh, Tim, who was helping us um, uh, and, and leading the setting out of the ellipse um, for uh, our drawing on the floor in Dublin, uh, the week after that went back to Oxford and stood on the site and started to set out the ellipse with the contractors. Um, and I think, uh, if I'm right, that ours was definitely done manually, but even in the digital age, the contractors wanted to set their one out manually as well. And that's a beautiful process. I think it's worth saying that the first drawing that was done was in the sense of a building that had been designed. And it allowed us to open up a space between uh, design and construction. But I think that there's an extraordinary possibility for far more interesting ways of doing that than we had thought about at the time. And I hope that some of the other drawings that I showed later on in the presentation show how that can be opened up into a much more inventive proposition. Uh, I think it's really interesting that you pick up Mariah's relationship to drawing, because there are some people, I think, like Mariah's and Salter, who draw like they build. They really don't see much of a difference between drawing and building. It seems as though they're not just complementary tasks, but they're as if they are each other in some way. And so I think there's lots of scope for extending that. And it was a very interesting comment. Um, fantastic, thank you. Um, so one question that I don't quite understand, but I'll just throw it out there. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, and Ian, who asked that? Hi, I just wanted to ask if you would be interested in using the methods shown in the lecture to engage those outside the office, end users, stakeholders, and so on, in the design process. Could this be a valid approach to user engagement? 
And I think we do use that in different ways. And I think that some of the open-endedness you see in our processes here um, have been used by us with clients. In a sense, that would be another talk. Uh, I'd be interested to hear if you wanted to send me an email or a suggestion about ways that we might do it. It would be a really nice conversation. It is something we do a little bit, but probably not as comprehensively as we do internally between ourselves. Okay, lovely. So I think that's all we had time for. Um, I think James is now ready to show us how far he got with um, putting all our lovely drawings together into one whole. Um, James, are you here? Yep, I'm here. Thank you, Adelina. So in the background, as Adelina and Neil have been saying, we've been collating all the drawings together and it sort of created this sort of overlap, overlapping and multiplying nature that sort of resulted into this sort of tapestry. Um, fortunately, we've had the help from Kevin Pollard, who's a composer who has provided us with some audio. And as we approach just in time towards eight o'clock, what we're going to do is share the collective drawing together and all clap for the NHS. Come on, come on.